when I was younger, occasionally I would get to choose where my family would go out to dinner. And there were two of us, so it didn't happen very often because normally if, if either I or my sister chose, the other one of us by default wouldn't like that choice. Not necessarily because we didn't like the restaurant, but just because our sibling made the choice. And so we didn't always get to choose, but sometimes on a rare occasion, I would get to choose. And when I was, when I was in grade school, the choice I was always going to make when I could choose where to go to dinner was going to be Pizza Hut. Now, some of you have never had the experience experience of actually dining into a Pizza Hut, and there aren't many left. I don't know if there's any left in the country, but they were under these giant red roofs, and you would walk in, and you would just be assaulted with the smell of pizza, which is an amazing experience, and, and, and except as you'd place your order, you then had to wait, and they had a salad bar, but what grade school kid wants to hit up a salad bar? And so you just had to sit there, and that was the worst part of the Pizza Hut experience, is, is just sitting there and having to wait. And there was a jukebox, but I was never allowed to play the jukebox, so I was at the mercy of whatever somebody else was playing on the jukebox, just having my senses assaulted with that sweet, sweet smell of pizza baking. And, and then we went to Pizza Hut on one occasion, and all of a sudden they were running a promo. That if uh, they didn't cook your pan pizza in 14 minutes, you got it for free. So they would put a timer on our table. Because as the great theologian Tom Petty once wrote, waiting is the hardest part. And uh, either you're not familiar with Tom Petty or what theologian means. If you didn't get that one, that's all right. But uh, greatest songwriter of the last generation. Waiting is the hardest part. And so when they ran this promo, there was a little, little timer on our table. And I remember just staring at that timer. Number one, because it meant that pizza was on its way. And number two, I've always been cheap. And so the idea of a free pizza was even better, even though I wasn't paying. Somehow, I had, I had an interest in this experience, and I watched as that timer ticked, and then the timer hit 15 seconds, and our pizza wasn't on the table. And I'm like, oh, it's going to be, it's going to be. And then the waitress came over and grabbed the timer when there were six seconds left on the timer. And the pizza still wasn't on the table. And I'm like, let's talk to the manager. And my dad's like, no. And I'm like, why? He's like, the pizza's coming right now. I'm like, but it wasn't on the table. <laughs> He's like, it's all right. It's all right. There's just something about that process of waiting that I don't know about you, but I hate and I recognize some people have more patience than others, but I think within all of us, there's just that, that discomfort of wanting to know something. We want to know it right now, whether it's the results of a, a medical test or a college application, whether it's a job interview or you've sent somebody a message asking them out on a date. You want the answer, and you want it right now. And when we wait, we allow ourselves to go through all kinds of different scenarios. We allow our mind to wander. Sometimes it's not even something that we try to do. Intrusive thoughts just come, and they guide our minds and take us places we never wanted to go. But without the information, we're at mercy of those thoughts. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you've had legal charges pending against you. But that's where we find Paul today. We've been walking through the, the development of the early church and we have seen as God has done extraordinary things and the message of the hope of Jesus has spread from region to region. And yet what we've seen is it's seldom been easy. It's always been blessed, but it's seldom been easy. And we arrived a few weeks ago as Acts starts to conclude where Paul is saying, I've got this passion to go back to Jerusalem. And everybody who loved Paul in his life said, don't do it, don't go. And he said, you don't understand. I don't care if I die, I have to go back to Jerusalem. And so he went back to Jerusalem and people tried to kill him. And he was arrested. And last week, as we looked at Acts chapter 23, we saw how there was a plot to assassinate Paul. And how ultimately he was snuck 
out of town to have an audience with the governor. And that's where we pick up today. So if you have your phones or your tablets, I'd invite you to follow along with us in the Bible app. It's free resources you can find in whatever app store you utilize. And once it's installed in your device, there are a number of fantastic features in the Bible app. One we use every single week together here at Lakeside is called Events. You can either enable your locations or write in Lakeside Community Church, Algoma. You can follow along with us that way. If you have a traditional Bible with you this morning, we continue our look at the New Testament book of Acts. Acts is the fifth book in the New Testament right after the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Next comes the book of Acts. We're going to be in the beginning part of Acts chapter 24 this morning. If you're joining us via the stream this morning, thanks so much for joining us. My name is Brian. I'm part of the team here at Lakeside, and the verses will be available for you on the screen below as we pick up the account Paul has now been taken. He's been held at Herod's Praetorium. He's been taken out of Jerusalem. And in Acts chapter 24, verse 1, we read this. And after five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and a spokesman, one Tertullus. They laid before the governor their case against Paul. Now, Paul has been there, and he's been held for five days, and for five days he's had to wait as his accusers, who've accused him of false things that we saw documented in Acts chapter 23, have now arrived, and they are presenting the same case before the governor, Felix, and this time they bring with them an attorney, Tertullus. He's essentially an attorney, and he's going to argue the facts for why Paul is guilty and should be killed. And when he had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Since through you we enjoy much peace, and since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made for this nation, in every way and everywhere we accept this with all gratitude. But to detain you no further, I beg you in your kindness to hear us briefly. This is the introduction. This is Tertullus' introduction to the governor, Felix. And this is just classic sucking up. That's all this is. This is just classic. You're standing before the governor, and you're telling the governor how incredible he is and what a great job he's doing. This is, this is what these three verses are. He's telling him, you, you, because of you, Felix, we enjoy peace. And because of how wise you are, because of your foresight, Most excellent, Felix. Reforms are being made in this nation. You are a fantastic leader. You have brought about peace. You have brought about reform. You have made all of the necessary changes that we need made, and you have done that in every way, in every way, in everywhere. We are so thankful for you. We are so thankful for you. This is the kid that everybody else in the class wants to beat up at recess because of how they're interacting with the teacher, okay? Because everybody else can spot this from a mile away. We can spot this from a mile away. Now, here's something we talk about, and we talk about this somewhat regularly, but it's this idea in life. And and if you've been around Lakeside, you've heard me talk about this. It's important in life not to count your critics, but to weigh them. Not to count your critics, but to weigh them. Because Some people are going to have feelings about you, and sometimes they're justified, and sometimes they're not. And you cannot live your life without without experiencing criticism, and you cannot make a choice without somebody not liking it, and that's fine. So you just have to understand, if you're going to live your life, you're going to have criticism on some level, and there's going to be critics. And the important thing is not to count your critics, but to weigh them, because... Not everyone is equally wise. Not everyone is equally informed. Everyone, especially because of social media, now has a platform. But everyone's feedback is not equal. And if you spend your life constantly concerned about the fact that, oh, I offended somebody, or somebody doesn't understand this aspect of what I'm doing, or somebody criticized me over here, and you don't think to yourself, is that person wise? Are they informed? 
What is the trajectory of their life? Then you are going to drive yourself absolutely crazy. Do not count your critics. Weigh them. It's the reason that I, I don't look at anything, good or bad, if it's anonymous. I don't. I don't, I don't want to see it. I don't care. It, it could be the nicest thing ever. I, I don't care. And the reason for that is because as much as we talk about don't, don't count your critics, weigh them, you also shouldn't count your praise. You should weigh it. And we see the dangers. I think the dangers are, are much more obvious. They're much more obvious when, when we talk about not counting our, our critics but weighing it. The dangers there are, are obvious to us all. But the dangers of us not counting our praise but weighing it is all of a sudden if people are uninformed, if people aren't wise, if the trajectory of their life isn't what it should be, and they're singing our praises, and we buy into all of that, then we can become proud. We can become arrogant. We can become blind to things that we do need to adjust, that we start to diminish because we've received the praise. And it can be a drug. It can be euphoric to get that feedback and to hear how incredible we are. But it's just as dangerous for us if we aren't weighing our praise as it is if we aren't weighing our criticism. Because none of us are perfect. All of us are blind spots. All of us have areas that God is working on in our lives that we need to continue to develop and we need to continue to grow. And we need to be cognizant of that fact constantly. Depending on your position in life, you may have more opportunities for people to flatter you than other positions in life. And I know it feels good. I know it's exciting. But the challenge for us to be well-adjusted and to live out to our full potential, which God has for us, and to make sure that we are keeping ourselves primed for the work that God is doing within us to make us more like Him, is for us to recognize that we need to weigh our critics and we need to weigh our praise. That we are not completely horrible and we aren't completely perfect. And we need to be people who, who people can talk to, who people can challenge, who people can encourage. And make sure our lives are ready for that. Tertullus continues. For we have found this man a plague, Paul. One who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He says, Paul is a plague, stirring up riots among Jews everywhere. Now remember, some of the accusations that they've made against Paul are unfounded. Some of them were a result of a mistaken identity. And some of the accusations of Paul are absolutely right. And have there been riots places? Yes. Are they Paul's fault? No. But have there been riots places as the result of him proclaiming the hope of Jesus? Yes. And here's another tactic that we see. When people don't like you, they will try to blame you for their actions. When people don't like you, they will try to blame you for their actions. Well, he's the result of, because of Paul, there are riots everywhere. What has Paul been doing? He's been telling people about the hope of Jesus and the visceral response that they have has created riots. And so what do they do because they don't like Paul? They accuse him and his message of being responsible for the riots. Beware this tactic. This is what happens when people don't like you. They will react, they will respond, and then ultimately after they snap, well, it's your fault. You triggered me. 
You did this. There's nothing new that's prevalent in our society now when everybody wants to be a victim. I can fly off the handle, I can lose my mind, and ultimately I can't be held liable because you did something that caused me to act that way. And as people that love and follow Jesus, we have to understand, first of all, there's nothing new under the sun. And depravity takes different forms, but there's nothing new. This has been going on forever, and we see it right here. The playbook hasn't changed. The way it's projected has changed, but the playbook hasn't changed. He continues, he even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to find out from him about everything of which we accuse him. We seized him because he was going to destroy the temple. Just question him yourself, Tertullus says. Just question him yourself and you'll discover everything that I have said is true. Now, you might be scratching your head right now if you're following along in the Bible app or if you have a traditional Bible with you. And and you might be asking yourself, wait a minute, I I understand what's going on. I understand what the claims are what's going on. I I understand all that, but why'd you skip verse 7? What what happened to verse 7? Now, some manuscripts... After verse 6, where he says, he even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him at this. And we would have judged him according to our law. And then verse 7 says, but the chief captain Lysias came and with great violence took him out of your hands, commanding his accusers to come before you, and then picks up verse 8 from there. But you might be scratching your head and saying, wait, wait a minute, what what happened to verse 7? And and why why is it not there? And so I just want to use this opportunity to talk a little bit about the formation of Scripture. And understand the verse breakdowns, okay? Scripture is ultimately inspired by God. Supernaturally, God presented the message of Scripture to human authors, but ultimately the source of Scripture is God. That's what we mean when we say that Scripture is inspired by God. The the actual numbers... Like, chapters and verses are not. Chapters and verses are not. When the Gospels were written, for instance, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these were were accounts similar to biographies, different than a biography, but similar to biographies of today. If you were to pick up a biography of somebody off, off the bookshelf and you were to open up the book, there aren't chapters and verses, generally, numbers in that. That's just not the way that that most things are broken down. But in 1555, there was a man named Robert Esteen, also known as Robertus Stephanus, who published a Vulgate, and the Vulgate was a 4th century uh, uh, accumulation of Scripture, and he incorporated verse and chapter breakdowns into the text in order to help people, as they studied Scripture, to find things faster. Here's the thing. We have since, and and remember, this is 1555. Our world is radically different now. We are way more connected than than people were in 1555. Most people in 1555 never left the town they were born in. They they just stayed there. They, They never traveled. They didn't certainly get out of their region. And so... What we have discovered is that we have earlier manuscripts than what the Vulgate, which was published in the late 4th century, we have earlier manuscripts available than what were discovered then. And so in some of the earliest manuscripts, a few, and there aren't many, but a few verses similar to verse 7 here in Acts chapter 24, do not appear in the earlier manuscripts. So does that mean that somebody was, was 
was trying to create a fraud? Does that, what does that mean? Well, most likely what happened is in the same way that there are study Bibles today, what most likely happened during the translation of, of the Vulgate was that there were notes written. There were notes written in the margin that would provide more information. And so most likely, verse 7 in this instance isn't likely in, in the text of Scripture. But more likely than not, it is a supplemental note that's added there. And so for that reason, most, most versions of the Bible now, when they're published, will include it, but will include it with an asterisk and either put it down in the margins or they'll bracket it right there in the text. Now, the reason that I spend time on this is because Scripture is our ultimate source. It's our ultimate source for knowing God. It's our ultimate source for understanding God. It's our ultimate source for, for understanding how God wants us to live our lives. And what I want you to recognize, and what we'll talk about some other time, is how we can be confident of the document that we have that it actually aligns with the message that God wants us to receive. And the fact of the matter that this, that this verse probably wasn't included in the earliest manuscripts should in no way cause you to question, well, wait, does that mean that Scripture isn't valid? If anything, it should increase your confidence in the validity that we are saying, hey, some of the earliest manuscripts don't include this. So that's the reason I just wanted to camp out there for a minute. And I, I know that there's nothing to do with the trial of what Paul's going on. But I want you to understand that we can have confidence when we read Scripture that we're connecting with the heart of God. And I just wanted to spend that time to let you know where that verse, why that verse probably wasn't included. We go back now. Verse 9, the Jews also joined in the charge, affirming that all these things were so. So Tertullus has given the open argument, and now witnesses have been called, and they're all accusing Paul of trying to start riots, of trying to cause trouble. And when the governor had nodded to him to speak, Paul replied, Knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. You can verify that it is not more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem. And they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogue or in the city. Neither can they prove to you what they now bring up against me. And here's Paul's, oppor Paul's opportunity to give a defense. And after he starts with some pleasantries, because that's just wise. I mean, you've just heard Tertullus tell the, tell the governor how incredible he is. You should probably do the same thing. Just play the game a little bit. And then Paul says, hey, I have evidence. I have the receipts. Here's what really happened. And you can go talk to people. You can go verify that I'm not guilty of these charges that they've levied against me. And then he continues. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. And so Paul is giving his defense. And notice what he's just done in his defense. As he's giving his defense, he ties in the message of the gospel. The very thing they are trying to silence him from. The very reason that he is on trial to begin with. And he is there. And as he stands before the governor, he uses it as an opportunity to proclaim his hope in Jesus. He says, you have heard them talk about what they call a sect. Which is the way. This was how followers of Jesus were characterized at that time. In the same way today that somebody would be called a Christian or a Christ follower. 
at that point, they were, call, they were calling people that followed Jesus the way. This is how followers of Christ were known. And Paul says, yeah, I'm a part of that. And here's what that means. Here's how I define that. That I worship God. That I worship God. That the Old Testament, the Old Testament's from God. It's inspired. And it is the foundation. It is the foundation of everything that we believe. But Christ is the fulfillment. He's the fulfillment of the prophecy. He is the one who was promised. He is the way that we can have a restored and renewed relationship with God. He is the hope. As the Old Testament painted the picture of a, of a God who created us and of a humanity that rebelled against Him because God's the Creator, so God gets to make the rules. And God has a standard. And unfortunately for us all, God's standard is pass fail. And what makes things even worse for us is God's standards perfection. And so you might be really good, really, really, really good. You might be somebody that everybody looks up to and says, I want to be like that person. They're just salt of the earth, good, honorable, moral people. But the message of the gospel and the message of scripture is that isn't enough. And the reason it isn't enough is because God's standard isn't, well, lay it all out on a scale and if you do a little more good then a little more bad you're in. Or if you do a lot more good then you do bad, you're in. God's standard is perfection. And the reason for that is because God's holy. And he's perfect. And he's the creator, so he gets to make the rules. And the disappointing thing for all of us is that we don't meet that standard. We don't measure up. That even for the person that wants to personify themselves as being perfect in their mind and in their heart is the knowledge of the incidences where they have not measured up. And the Old Testament paints a picture for us. That we can't meet God's standard. We can't measure up. And yet, we're given glimpses in the Old Testament that a Savior is coming. And that even though we've rebelled, and even though we've fallen short, that God still somehow chooses to love us. Not because we've earned it and not because we've deserved it, but that's just because of who God is. That he's gracious and merciful. That he desires people to repent. And he wants a relationship with broken and flawed people. And that he would make a way that even in our rebellion, we could find restoration. And we could find forgiveness. And we could find hope. And then Paul says, and that hope is here. And his name is Jesus. And he was perfection because he was fully divine. And he was full humanity all wrapped up in one. And he was the fulfillment of the promise of his father. And he came, and he lived, and he proclaimed hope, and he proclaimed truth. 
And some accepted him. But most rejected him. And they crucified him. But that's not where the story ends. And three days later, he rose again, proving that he was divine and proving that the sacrifice for our sin had been approved by God. And then he appeared to over 500 men and witnesses. That is the account of the scriptures. That is the hope that we have. And Paul says, because of what Jesus has done, and because if we place our faith and trust in him, we can experience this hope that we recognize and we understand that there is resurrection. And if we have the hope of Jesus, we are so thrilled because at that time, we will be renewed and we will be restored and we will experience intimacy with our Creator. And the message that Paul says as he looks right at the governor and right at those who accuse him is, but the resurrection doesn't only belong to the just. And one day we all will stand before God before a holy, perfect God and have to give an account for the choices and the decisions that we have made and the hope that you and I and everyone in this world has if we'll accept it. It's that on that day when God looks at me he won't see every stupid choice I've made and there's plenty. He won't see all the ways I've failed to measure up. They're numerous. But when he looks at me, he'll see the sacrifice of his son. He won't see my imperfection. He'll see the perfection of his son who paid the price for me. That God made Jesus sin for me. So that when he looks at me, he sees his blood. That's what Corinthians says. God made him who had no sin to be sin so that in him we might have a restored relationship with God. Not that Jesus sinned, but he paid the price for my sin. So I always take pains, Paul says, to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. When you live for eternity, it changes the way you live. Paul who people beg, don't go, don't go, don't go to Jerusalem. He said, you don't get it. I don't care if I die. I'm going. And now he's here. And he's on trial. And he's looking his accusers dead in the eye. And he says, I know why I'm on trial. And here, before the governor, I'm going to say the very same message that brought me on trial. And I don't care. This is the message. And when you live for eternity, it changes the way you live and it gives you freedom because you recognize that this is not the end, that there is more than this. And if we follow after Jesus, the hope that we have is not that he just makes tomorrow better. And he does, by the way. 
And not just that he transforms today, and he does, by the way. That he transforms everything about our future, which transforms everything about our existence. That's the hope of the gospel. That Jesus transforms us today, he transforms our tomorrows, he transforms our eternities. And this changes the way we live. Because all of a sudden, my critics can say whatever they want to about me. And people's praise is no longer my end goal. Because there's something so much greater. A God who loves me and created me and restored me and redeemed me. And so in a minute, I'm going to pray and then we're going to sing a song. And as we sing that song, we're going to pass out some elements of communion. We would ask you just to hang on to those. If you've made the decision to follow after Jesus, we invite you to take part in that. If you haven't made that decision, probably just pass it past you. It's probably not going to make all that much sense to you anyways. And, and what this is, is it's a symbol. It's a symbol of the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus. That our redemption was purchased when his body was broken on a cross. His blood was poured out for us. And if that's hope that you've never experienced, if that's hope that you've never received, in a minute I'm going to whisper a prayer. And if that's hope that you're ready to embrace in your life and you're ready to live for Jesus, then I would just invite you to repeat that prayer back in your heart as long as you mean it. There's nothing magical or special or supernatural about the, the words, but it's just an acknowledgement of redemption and hope and repentance and faith that you believe in your heart. God, I pray that you would let us live for eternity. That we would have confidence in how we face each and every day. God, that we would be transformed and we would focus on more than the trivial. I pray for the person, God, who needs the hope of a relationship with you that has never experienced that before. But God, they know, they know that they don't meet your standard and they know, God, that they need a relationship with their creator. And I pray right now in this moment, in this room, and as they watch online, this would be the moment they stop running. It would be the moment they stop fighting. their heart they embrace you they would just cry out to you God that I'm a sinner I have flaws and failures imperfections and mistakes God I need you to save me And I know you love me. Even in the midst of my brokenness. Even in the midst of my flaws. So much that you sent your son Jesus. To die for me. And my sin. And three days later he rose again. So I put my faith in you Jesus. want to live for you. Change my life like you've just changed my destiny.